I also know that as readers, we share books, don't we? I mean, we give them away to our friends, and some of them was, earlier was telling me that she put little notes in there to say, I want this one back, you know, and we all know stories of people who didn't give us their books back, and, and I remember reading once about Ben Franklin, who actually sort of, you know, began the library system. He said, never loan your books to people because they're notorious for not returning them. And he said, as a matter of fact, I have an entire shelf in my library made up of books that I have failed to return. So, <laughs> and I'm, what I'm here to do tonight is to tell you some stories, because that's basically what I do. But that's what you all do, too, because stories are the most powerful way we have of organizing human experience. D.H. Lawrence said, the stories tell us who we are and who we will become. And when William Faulkner accepted the Pulitzer Prize in 1954, he said the only stories worth a writer's blood and sweat and tears were stories of the human heart in conflict with itself. A Willa Cather, who also won the Pulitzer, she says that the stories that engage us as adults are based on experiences that we had before we turned 15. People have, we have stories. All of our stories matter, and they're important stories in our life. And sometimes people will say, well, I'd like to write my story down, but my sister doesn't remember it that way. Or my brother, doesn't, he doesn't remember that happened. And that's because those are two different stories. And you have a right to your story because you're, it's your experience. And sometimes people will say, well, I didn't make notes when I was, going, when I was in the war. Or I didn't make notes when I was you know, traveling. And you know, I'd like to write about that, but I didn't make notes. But even if you had made notes, you would write a different story. And the process of writing that story down, you can get the details. I mean, Google can get you almost anything about what day of the week it was that you were in Lebanon or whatever. Um, but nobody else but you can tell that story because that's your experience. <laughs> so tonight what I wanted to do um, is tell you a story of a word, and the word is credit. Now, this will seem like a strange thing to talk about, but I want to tell you a little story about why I want to talk about credit. Um, the word credit actually, we think about it as a financial word, and it is, but it comes from the Greek and it means to believe, from the, from the Greek word credere. And um, Jerry and I were in Florida visiting his daughter a couple of winters ago, and his daughter gave us a massage for a Christmas present. So we were having this wonderful massage therapist, and I always like to hear people's stories about how they got into what they're doing. And, and she told me this story, and she said, well, um, she had married her high school sweetheart, they'd gone to college, and um, he was a very dynamic businessman, he was up and coming, they had two young children, and they moved from Maine to Florida, and they had lived there maybe not quite a year when he had died of a, a very massive uh, brain tumor. And she had these two little children, and she said, I was just, I was, I was in a, what I would call a wilderness place. She said, I just don't know what I can do, should I go back to my family, should I stay here, what should I do? And she said, and I was just feeling like I'd never worked in my life or pay, and what, what was I going to do? And she said, I'm in my car, and I'm sort of crying out to God, saying, give me a sign, show me a sign, what should I do? And she pulled up to this stoplight, and off to the side was a real estate, um, a used car dealership. And there was a light, a sign flashing, and the sign said, give yourself credit. <laughs> and so she took that. Not to be credit to buy a car, but to look at what kind of credit she needs to give herself, to believe in herself. And so I want to tell you some stories about each of the letters in the word credit, because that's a way I can remember, and I'm getting older, and it's helpful for me to do it that way. Right? Uh, we want trouble. We want trouble in our lives. We don't personally want trouble, but we want our characters to have trouble. Um, the next one is here, D. And that's, you know, you all will recognize this because it's the, the word is denari, and it means in the Latin to give, to give a gift. And that's that whole thing about being generous, the ability to give to other people. After we had our airplane accident, um, and we had three of our legs were in casts, and our arms were all in casts, and the neighbors came down to do some work for us, and it was really a hard day for us to sit on this deck with our, you know, feet up with our casts, and my parents had come to take care of us, and and it was hot, and there were rattlesnakes out there, and they were putting irrigation line in. And one of the ranchers came up, and he said, how are you doing, you know, this Mr. Cheery? And I said, not very good. You know, we didn't expect other people to get caught up in our homesteading adventure, you know. And I said, there are people out here we don't even know, and we'll never be able to thank everybody or, you know, repay them or anything. And he said, oh, Jane, you missed the point. He said, we love doing this, and you give to us when you let us. I think when you give yourself credit, you know how to give, but you also know how to receive. 
Um, but when Jerry and I were building our place, he sent me down to get a hacksaw. And he was sort of grumpy, and he said, you know what a hacksaw is, don't you? And I went, yeah, yeah, I know. You know, and a hacksaw is a little lower across here and has the blade lower anyway. And so when I went to the shop, I got the hacksaw, and then I found one that looked like this. And I thought, well, I better bring them both back, because I wasn't exactly sure. So I gave him the hacksaw, and he was happy. And so after he finished, I said, well, what's this? And he said, oh, that's a coping saw. And I said, oh, you mean like I have trouble coping with you? Because <laughs> it's just, you know, it's a little mental health word, right? Coping. And, and he said, yeah, it's the same word. And I said, well, what's it used for? And he said, well, it's used to fit things into tight places, like a cabinet into a corner, or those big puzzles, wooden puzzles that kids have, you know. And, and I still didn't really understand why that would call it coping. And he said, well, it's the blade. The blade is really strong, but it's really flexible. If it was too strong, it would splinter what you're trying to fit. And if it was too flexible, it would leave gaps. That in order to cope, you have to have both strength and flexibility. And he said it just like that, kind of out there in the sagebrush. You know, it was like the Marlboro Man meets mental health. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then later, another gentleman told me that this, uh, this kind of a blade, a coping saw blade, allows you to change directions quickly without a lot of friction. Isn't that wonderful? What a metaphor. <laughs> and so I use that almost verbatim in the book, A Sweetness to the Soul. And um, at the time that I, um, it was just sort of almost the conversation that we had, and this man from Florida read that book. He was remodeling a house, and the woman had the book on her coffee table, and he asked to borrow it. And he said, I read it through the night. And he said, that coping saw, he said, that's the kind of dad I want to be. I want to be strong, but not so strong I'm rigid. And it's the kind of husband I want to be. I want to be flexible, but not so flexible that I can be walked all over. I want to be a coping kind of man. And I think that to believe in ourselves, to give ourselves credit, we have to recognize that we can be coping kinds of people. That this is one of the tools that we have. There are lots of other tools, but to cope, to be able to change directions, and this is a time in our life and in our world around us where we have to be able to figure out things aren't always going to go smoothly, and how can we make the changes that are critical? How can we stand for what, something but not stand so that we're rigid and, and, and get, you know, get splintered, or that we you know, are flexible but not so flexible that we stand for nothing? How do we do that in such a way that we also don't create a lot of friction in the capacity to keep solving problems and moving forward.